Okay. Hi, y'all. I'm Kat. I use pronouns she and they. I'm on the mic today because M. Kat was kind enough to film this presentation for us so we can use it in the future. It feels a little silly because it's a small group, so just bear with me. And I'm here from the UM Food Pantry as the student coordinator. Cool. So a little bit of my background, why I got into this work. Um, I started at UM in 2014, uh, and I finished in 18 with a degree in Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Sociology and then panicked, applied to grad school, and ended up working with Jordan Lyons at the Renner Center and kind of fell into this work um, through some of my own personal experiences and hearing from a lot of friends who were struggling as well. Um, I personally uh, dealt with a lot of food insecurity as well as homelessness when I was in my undergrad career here and became really frustrated that there wasn't a ton of actual resources for me on campus. Um, I was already spending all of my money here and all of my time here. Why couldn't they give back to me in any way? Um, and I was lucky enough to work with Jordan and Adrian Smith and a ton of other awesome people on campus to kind of rally together and say, screw it, we're doing this. We're starting a food pantry. Yeah, and I've been, oh yeah, I'm also still a student because I panicked and applied to grad school. I'm in public administration um, and hope to carry that forward and continue working in college food justice for the rest of my life. So let's talk about the problem first. Um, you saw maybe as you were coming in these four posters at the front of the room. That's just like a general breakdown. If you need more definitions or information, feel free to look at them again at the end um, and to interrupt me at any time for questions or thoughts or like, my hair looks good. Um, thank you, I won. Um, so food insecurity is something that I think we're all familiar with, even if we don't actually know the jargony term. Um, we've all, or whether we personally or know somebody who has, um, know the feeling of wondering where your next meal is coming from or thinking like, do I spend $600 on this textbook or buy groceries for the next God knows how long? Um, or even just thinking, crap, I forgot to bring lunch today. I don't really have the money to spend on it. I'll just wait to eat until I get home. All those are not great feelings and I think become exacerbated for full-time students because we don't have the time oftentimes to make enough money. So we know at UM that um, according to the Real College survey we ran last fall that 42% of resp respondents reported food insecurity in the past 30 days, 55% of respondents were housing insecure in the last year, and 28% of resp respondents or homeless in the last year. And that was roughly a 7.6 response rate to so 902 students. Um, and we know that all of these problems go together and that the first two statistics track roughly with national averages and then UM has almost double the national average of college homelessness. And that has to do with a lot of things. I'm here mostly to talk about food, but we know that housing in Missoula is really tough right now for everybody across the board, homeowners, renters, um, and that, again, being a student makes it more difficult because, again, where do you have time to work? Um, do you know if the landlords will rent to you or if they have a history of not really loving renting to students? You have to be more concerned about the 30-day no-cause eviction law. There's all sorts of stuff that kind of complement complicates our situation. And then, we know that hunger, um, is a lot more than just a health problem. We know that it can, impact, it can impact a lot of other parts of our lives, and I'd love to hear from y'all about any of that, or if you want me to just move on, everybody blank stare at me, which would be great. Yeah? Um, I used the food pantry this morning to make things more interesting. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and we know that, you know, coming to campus knowing that you don't have lunch later sucks and is not fun and can make it really hard to focus in class. Um, I know I have personally experienced this, maybe some of y'all have too, um, but I remember my stats class senior year in undergrad was like noon, which for me is lunchtime. Uh, for many people is lunchtime. And I remember sitting there thinking, I don't have money to buy lunch later, I don't have time to go home and eat later, so having to consciously make the choice to suppress the sounds my stomach were making so I wasn't annoying the other people in class and try to focus. But all I could think about was how freaking hungry I was and how frustrating it was that there was nothing that my campus could do for me. 
yet, but now we're here. So just like lovely Ev, anyone is welcome to stop by and get food at any time from the pantry. We have all sorts of good lunch stuff and potatoes. 90 pounds of potatoes, please come take our potatoes. Yeah. So why are students going hungry? There are like 107 reasons and absolutely they differ student to student. This is just kind of a general breakdown of the biggest ones. So firstly, there's the obvious one. College is super expensive. I'm paying personally as an out-of-state grad student more than $12,000 a semester for like seven credits. That's a lot. When my folks were in school in like 72, 83 respectively, they never went over four grand a year. And mom was at Gonzaga, which is private, and dad was an out-of-state student at Northern Arizona. So that shows that this has rocketed up over the last decades. Um, so at UM in particular, 2011 cost for an in-state student per semester was a little over $2,800. That number is now closer to 4,000, roughly 3,500 per semester full-time. So that's close to double what my folks were paying um, back in the 70s and 80s. And again, they were at pretty friggin' expensive schools. Um, and of course, tuition isn't the only cost of attendance that matters. We also have to worry about room and board, um, whether that's the dorms or off campus. We have to worry about textbooks and fees. I know that I get help with my tuition but fees and textbooks are all out of pocket for me, and that's a pretty stressful expense at the beginning of every semester, which, because I have campus jobs, also happens to be when I've been working the least amount and have the least amount of money to cover it. And that is hard to walk into the semester having to choose between textbooks and food, or walking to class and then getting shamed by a professor for not having your textbook on time what, because they don't know that you had to make that really tough choice. And then second, this is one of my favorites right now, and I brought a tweet to share with y'all. Um, college students aren't kids. We're all in this room, I'm guessing, above the age of 18. Um, and whether or not your maturity level is far and beyond that, who cares? The point is, at 18, you're expected to make all these tough decisions on your own, and in many families, expected to make all these tough financial choices on your own. And as long as campuses continue to treat students as if they don't know or they're just not responsible enough to make these hard choices, it's harder, it becomes harder to learn how to do it yourself. So whether that's saying meal plans exist because students are too irresponsible to handle their own money. So we take their parents' money, dole it out to them weekly, and that's how we teach them responsibility. That's not teaching, that's patronizing and it's paternalistic. Um, so focusing on, instead of saying, oh, it's your fault you're in this situation, you're dumb, you spent your money on beer or pizza, or you just really love ramen. No one really loves this ramen, I promise you. Um, I crave it like every three weeks, but that's it. Um, we need to treat college students like the adults that we are. And that starts by encouraging folks to stop calling college students kids, which is a tough one, because we've all been doing it for a long time but I've been on my own since I was 18, so many of my friends, I don't feel like a kid, and neither do any of the people I know. And then, this is one that we hear about a lot, the rise in cost of living, compared to, again, when my folks were in school. Cost of living increased, so did minimum wage, but not enough to cover it. Um, and then on top of that, time is money, so students just, frankly, don't have the hours in the day to succeed and even excel academically, whether that's studying 40 hours a week or 20 hours a week, or if you're me, five, um, and then work enough to support yourself and then also get involved in awesome extracurricular activities or volunteerism. Students are often forced to pick and choose, and unfortunately, one of the first things that go out the window is your food budget. That's the most flexible part of most people's budget. My rent doesn't change every month. My electric bill only goes up every month. Food, I can get away with skipping if I have to, which I shouldn't be in that boat, but often that's a tough choice that students here are forced to make. And this tweet is from Dr. Sarah Goldrick Rabb, who is my academic hero. She is a professor of higher education policy and sociology out at the Hope Center for College Community and Justice, which is housed at Temple. So that's a really good resource if you want to later go on and do some more research on your own or look at some awesome policy initiatives that are coming out of this. I'd recommend looking at the Hope Center, which is hopeforcollege.com for number four. And 
Sorry, I'm juggling one extra thing that I wasn't expecting. Bear with me. Yeah. Then I'd love to talk a little bit about the pantry itself. So we were established just last year, February 2019. We're less than a year old, and so far have served more than 140 students at our main location, which is downstairs, UC 119, next to the ASUM offices, and then our four satellite locations, which are at the Veterans Office, Missoula College Room 430, American Indian Student Services, and then TRIO Student Services as well. And those are all self-serve locations, so I know how much food has gone to and then disappeared from those cabinets. I don't know how many students are taking it, and I don't care. Those are set up so that students who don't feel comfortable showing their face at the food pantry to go get the help they need and then move along with their day, which is really important. And we focus really hard on being open to all. We believe in having very low and no barriers between students and food. It's already so hard to ask for help. It's so, there's so many stigmas and barriers. Um, and I have a lot of students that come into the food pantry really embarrassed that they have to be there at all, um, which is so frustrating to me because I'm here to help. I've got 90 pounds of potatoes and you have zero and I want to give you potatoes. Um, so what we care about the most is that we have food and we want to give it away. So we don't ask for a student status, we don't check for income, we don't ask about household size beyond are you getting enough food to feed your entire household. Um, and that was really important to me and that mirrors the model they use over at Missoula Food Bank and Community Center as well. They don't check for income. Um, so what we do have is the super short intake survey that students are welcome to use an alias on. I think I have one Batman in the system, I have a bunch of Joe Smiths, I have lots of something dough or something X, um, and that's great because I care more about how many visits we get per month than like the identity of each individual student. Um, and then it asks three questions, and that's it. That's the entire survey. Do you want do you want information about applying to the supplemental nutrition assistance program? Do you want information about housing resources? And is there anything else I can help you with today? I wanted to keep it short and sweet so that students could come in, get their food, and get out without having to worry about. What is Kat gonna know about me? You know, who else will know that I visited? Yeah. And then we're right now just staffed by myself and Sarah, our lovely uh, AmeriCorps Vista who works with us. Um, and then we're hoping to recruit more volunteers and increase our hours that way. Right now it's us and maybe three regular volunteers. So if that's something you're interested in doing, um, stick by and I will give you some contact info so you can sign up to do that. Yeah. And we actually have, um, before I forget, two more tours of the pantry happening as part of Diverse U. So if you want to meet me outside the ASUM offices tomorrow at 10 a.m. or 3 p.m., it's like a 15-minute walkthrough, and I'll tell you more about our specific services down there. Cool. And then one thing we try to focus on at the food pantry is just being aware of all our other resources on campus. Right now, I kind of store them all up here. So I've been on campus for 100 years. Um, and we, so I always like, at these presentations asking folks what other cool resources they know about. Sometimes we all know about the same ones, sometimes I find out about new ones. So is there anything like really cool happening at UM that y'all would love to share? I mean, out there, which is the student group Evelyn runs, is amazing um, and is another really good way to build community on campus for those who felt like they didn't have it. So that's a good resource. Yeah, yeah, ASUM Legal Services is awesome. They provide low to no cost legal assistance to students um, unless you're fighting the university or another student. Anything beyond that, they can help you with, and they're really, really awesome. Legal Services. Anything else? They want to have a question about services on campus? Okay. Cool. So, we built a food pantry. What next? So at the end of the day, we know that providing a sandwich to somebody in need only goes so far. It only gets them that sandwich. So what do you do next? And at the UM Pantry, we're really excited to get to work with ASUM and the foundation on bringing emergency grant programs to campus. Edquity is one example of those. So that's an app that um, has some neat budgeting tools so you can teach yourself how to budget. Um, it has a brief application, so you can apply for emergency aid that is then sent to your institution, and then your institution sends you a check. No questions asked, other than what's on the application. Um, which is awesome, that's one of the fastest ways to get students help. 
Minnesota, uh, their Office of Higher Education has a really awesome emergency grants program as well. That's a pretty giant pool of money that each, each institution can apply for a part of, and then that can then be sent out to students in need as well. Because we know that students are likely to experience, on average, a $500 emergency expense sometime while they're in school, and most students can't even cover 200. I know that right now I could cover 75 <laughs> in an emergency expense, which like, won't help me a ton if all my tires on my car blow out or my car breaks down or my cat gets sick again. Um, so it's one of those, that $75 or that $500 is the difference between staying in school and having to just stop and take care of other things in my life. And that's again, where hunger, where homelessness, where housing insecurity becomes an academic problem. At the pantry, at ASUM, we want to help students succeed and part of that is taking care of their human needs first. And then coalition building. Um, I'm really excited to work with all the other food pantries across the state. Uh, I know MSU has one, Bounty of the Bridgers. I think MSUB has one. Um, most of our tribal colleges have some sort of food assistance going on, which is awesome. And I'm really excited in the next year to work more on banding together so that we can all go to Ochi and say, hey, this is a real problem. It's time for the state to step in. Where's your help? Or where's the help coming from from you? Where are those dollars? What do we do next? Um, and that goes along with legislative change, whether it's Ochi or the general ledge. Um, I think that we've proven that this problem is big enough. UM can't handle it on its own. And right now, it's not even all of UM. It's our office. And we have two people. So I'm excited to work with other groups on and off campus um, to start to introduce some real, like, actual change to solve the problem, not just provide, provide food. Um, and then, like I mentioned with out there, community building is kind of the biggest thing for me right now, whether it's finding partners across Missoula, like the Peace Farm, or Lifeline Produce, or Missoula Food Bank and Community Center, um, or on campus, like the School of Social Work, or the UC. Um, I really wanna get working with as many groups on campus as I can. are rolling through it folks um, and then next here's some big exciting things happening at the food pantry first is there's a big food drive happening in the branch center downstairs on the second floor that's our center for diversity and inclusion on campus um, if you want to donate today's your last day they brought in a lot of food which would be awesome and then on Saturday can the cats starts can the cats is my favorite food drive across the entire year because it is massive Last year, they brought in more than 404,000 pounds of food to the excuse me, Missoula Food Bank. And that's food that they are able to get out to Missoulians from the 23rd or the last day of the food drive all the way through August. And not only does that bring in a lot of staples like rice and black beans and chicken noodle soup, soup it brings in a ton of variety, which brings a lot of dignity back into shopping at the food banks is because you're not walking in, getting the same tomato soup everybody else is. You get to pick and choose and take your favorite things and leave the things you hate, like lima beans. Um, we have three cans of lima beans on our shelves and they are not moving. So if you're really into lima beans, again, please come check out the food pantry. Um, one of them is spiced, whatever that means. Um, so that officially starts this Saturday, the 9th, and there are gonna be collection sites sites all the way across Missoula at most of the grocery stores and then a lot of really cool kind of community building events around it as well. Um, I think Kettle House has a pipe night, Western Cider's doing something. Um, and then on the 16th, we are running Ken Cats Collection at the Game Against Weaver State. So if you're interested in volunteering or donating, come find me afterwards or find us on Facebook. All of our information's up there. Um, and this is the first year that we've been open during Can the Cats. I'm really excited as a food pantry to get really involved and kind of jump in feet first. And after that will be our winter clothing drive that we're putting on with UMPT and the Branch Center. Um, again, check our Facebook. All the details will be there. I think the Branch Center and PT School will be the main collection sites. And then I'll have a big rack of winter clothes in the food pantry. And then lastly, something I'm really excited about, we started talking about this in like September, um, and it started as just the food pantry, throwing around ideas, trying desperately to find money and help across campus. And then the UM administration picked it up and helped us get money, which is awesome. So UM is throwing the big Thanksgiving dinner, the day before Thanksgiving, 
for students or anybody on campus who can't afford to go home, can't afford food, just wants to hang out with all their friends. That'll be really awesome. So keep your eye on your emails, um, students, to check out for a RSVP. And we'll be posting more about that on social media as well. Yeah. And that'll be 3 to 5 in the UC Ballroom on the 27th. I feel like I went really fast. I'd love to just chat if anyone has questions or really cool recipes for pumpkins or potatoes. Yeah? How can we, so, I'm gonna spoiler, Kat, Charlie, is gracing the Innovation Center with their presence on this panel. Um, I will probably be attending that as well. It's well, the Innovation Center, which the university put a bunch of money into building. Um, my issue is, can you go back to your stats real quick? Yeah. Let's, those are those are shocking numbers. Um, so let's see here, 42 percent. So almost half the student body is reported food insecurity in the last month. And you think it's more important to get access to 3D printers and vinyl cutters than you do to giving your students access to food. This is a gross misappropriation of funds and judgment by the university in order to see modern rather than active triage of problems on campus. How can we in this room pressure the UM administration to actually build this into a legitimate part of the foundation as it should have been decades ago? So that's one of my favorite questions. I agree with Evelyn 100%. Also, there are 3D printers in the Mansfield Library that anyone can use for pretty cheap um, already. But I think our biggest issue and the biggest reason why it feels like this problem is being overlooked or underprioritized is that it's just not on the agenda. Um, I talk to people every single day who ask, oh, you work in the food pantry? Is that like a coffee shop or like the market? Um, and then when I explain to them, no, we have starving students at UM, I was one of them, they're shocked. People are absolutely still floored that this problem exists at all. So kind of step number one is just talk about it all the time, all the time, whether you're hungry or whether you know a friend who's hungry, or if no one's talking in class, just, hey, y'all heard of the food pantry? Um, and a big part of that too is busting stereotypes. So there's a lot of really gnarly stereotypes about college students out there, you know, that we're kids, that we spend all our money on, you know, beer or ramen or that we like eating ramen all the time. Um, so it's a lot of, we have to make people aware of the issue and that's pretty frustrating to me. This is a problem that has existed long before my parents were in school. Um, it's just that all of a sudden, it's on people's radar. So as long as we keep that momentum rolling, and as long as we get a lot of folks at UM with a lot of fire under their butts, um, I think we can get a lot further than we have in the last year. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so if you look at like the National Real College data, one thing that kind of stands out is that a lot of students, like quite a large proportion of students are SNAP eligible, but mm -hmm. not that many are actually utilizing services. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is first, why do you think that is and second, how do we address that? Yeah, so there's a couple reasons why a lot of students are eligible for SNAP, um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly referred to as food stamps, um, but aren't applying. The first is, in my opinion, um, in the 80s, the I forget which administration, but a lot of extra rules for college students were added to SNAP. So that college students have to meet four extra, one of five extra things in order to qualify for SNAP at all. One of which is you have to work on average, uh, if you're not qualified for federal work study, you have to work an average of 20 hours per week, which I don't think I've done since I was in college till this year. That's a lot of work on top of being in school full time um, or being in school part time. Because life happens whether you have kids to take care of or a cat or a mom or you're just tired. You can't always find enough time to work. So that's a big part of it. Um, an important thing for everyone to know is if you're qualified for federal work study and you accept it and you take a federal work study job, you're automatically qualified for SNAP. You will get SNAP. You just have to apply. Um, so the other thing is just encouraging people to apply. Um, Sarah and I are both trained in SNAP application assistance, um, and we make sure anybody who shops at the pantry knows that we can help them do that. Um, it's kind of a frustrating application, so I think that's another big issue. This is a website designed by the federal government. 
it's not pretty um, or super easy to navigate, but it's really important that people sit down and stick through it, which is why I'm always happy to help folks do it. Um, and that's apply.mt.gov. You can apply for healthcare, you can apply for housing assistance, you can apply for SNAP, all in the same place. Um, and then, again, myth busting in the same area. My entire undergrad career, I thought that no college students were allowed to get SNAP at all, ever, period. I don't know where I heard that. I don't know who told me, but it's something that stuck in my head. So when I really needed help and could barely afford to pay rent, wasn't eating at all, this giant pool of assistance was out there and I thought I wasn't allowed to touch it because of some, again, gnarly stereotype or myth that got sent out into the universe. So again, focusing on myth busting, you can get SNAP and this is how. So apply.mt.gov. harder and harder to actually get those benefits because you know I'm working in a practical mm -hmm. doing hours a week so I feel that requirement. But they keep on asking me to provide new documentation mm -hmm. and then they don't accept it and I come back and have to provide other documentation. And it just takes, you know, weeks upon weeks to even get, you know, in the system. Yeah. So with the current administration, it has gotten more difficult to get SNAP and SNAP benefits are lower because it's getting just stripped to the bare bones. That doesn't mean it's not worth trying. Um, if you're able to muster up the energy and time, please do. And if you can't muster up the energy and time, I 100% understand that too. And the pantry will st still be here to get people food either way. But SNAP's a really awesome resource. Um, over the summer at almost all the farmers markets across Montana, you get double SNAP dollars. So instead of, you know, you'll pay $2 for cucumbers and then Missoula will give you two extra dollars of cucumbers which is awesome. Um, I really like cucumbers. Yeah. Any other questions? Either SNAP specific or pantry or? One of the reasons I was pretty concerned about, and we'll fill out a SNAP application again personally, was uh, I filled one out and they were, they initially said, well, I was looking at your income levels, like you definitely qualify for SNAP, but you apply for it, and then I did, and they're like, oh, and now you need to submit uh, the REI form, which was a request to the form. I had worked a 60-hour shift uh, at one point to cover like, this massive, they just did a rolling over shift, which like a 60-hour work week. I worked a 60-hour work week one week, and then 40-hour work week the others, so and normally I worked around 25 hours, um, uh, like every five of them. Amount. And so they're like, oh, your income is way too high, we're cutting your bank. And I lost my health insurance for two months. Um, I was not able to get it reinstated and get it to back pay, even though, like, next week um, I had, like, lower pay sets and stuff. Yeah. And there's a lot of folks that I think are understandably, like, worried because if you just apply for Medicaid, there's no real request other than like what the state your income is. It's a stated income form. But as soon as you go on to SNAP, it's an actual reported income. Yeah. And there are many people that could lose their insurance by just doing that. Yeah. So there are a lot of reasons that for folks who do know about SNAP and know it's a resource but cannot safely apply for it, and that's a big one, is that the income stuff just gets super tricky, especially if you're working like funky part-time jobs or kitchen jobs or like how you report tips, do you not report tips. Um, so that's, that does make it hard. And that again is why the pantry will always exist because so many people really struggle to get SNAP when they want to apply. Yeah. Do you have a question? Sure. Um, my name is Mark Persaus. I'm the faculty senate chair. I get the pleasure working with Abigail and Ethan on the issue. Okay. I really love what you're doing with the pantry. In cabinet, which is a privilege I get as faculty senate chair, I ask the question, knowing the answer. I said, are there staff and faculty who take advantage of the pantry? And Abigail said, they can. We don't ask mm -hmm. if you're a student or staff. But to make the point to admin that we have staff yeah. on staff, um, that it's not just students. Absolutely. Yeah. And I try to really emphasize the point when I do tours of the pantry and people just ask me about it, that our staff at UM are criminally underpaid in a lot of areas um, and that we no one has disclosed to me that there's staff at the pantry but would not be shocked if we had some shopping there already um, and it's another one of those 
where our dollar is coming from and where are they going and how do we reprioritize to make sure everybody at UM, student, staff, faculty, is paid fairly and can afford to eat. Like base level, the fact that they can't afford to eat is appalling to me. Yeah. So you're, you deal with the administration? You have an administration? Yeah. So like, I, I still don't, I'm sorry. I, it, and I know that there are maybe like weird economic justifications for this, but like why is it that you have this massive institute and yet you can't feed everyone on campus? Like that's like what? Like how how what mental gymnastics are we doing to pay a president of the university three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year or whatever you're paying it? And how much is that cap? Can I ask an additional question? Yeah. How much are you being paid an hour to do this work? Nine fifteen an hour part time. Nine fifteen an hour part time. Okay. So like how are we justifying that at all when you gave what is the size of that lobby or something? I don't know, but it's a free house. It's a free house? <coughs> free house and uh, three hundred and fifty thousand dollar a year salary. How are we justifying that when we have people that are either being fired or student like I'm starving? I run one of the largest student groups on campus. I do a shit ton of other work. I work with CAP and like how, how are we like supposed to build this institution of light and truth uh, that is literally stamped into the center of your gosh darn quad if we can't afford to feed it? Like what, whose who's neck do I have to grab by the back of it and pull them up and be like, fucking feed your students and your staff? And that's, that's kind of, again, the big issue right now is reprioritization and how do we frame this in a way that the folks up high, the folks in charge of the general fund um, see that it's a problem and motivate to put their money where their mouth is and pay our staff better and pay our student employees better and fund you know, programs like the Food Pantry or programs like Out There that are doing a ton to support our students um, with very little institutional support. I mean, we get a good amount of help from the admin and we really, really appreciate everything that we get, but we're still solely relying on grants and donations. Um, and we hope to change that in the next year. We're still pretty young, so that makes not a ton of sense. But it's worked so far, and we're hoping to change it soon. But again, it's reminding people that this problem exists, and that you have to reprioritize. And I, yeah, I wish I knew why it worked out the way it did. But it's really hard. Um, so I care about UM so much. I love this campus so much. Um, hate football. No interest in the Chris football team. But people care about each other here. Whether we see that from the top down or bottom up, or if it's just like me and Ev and Sarah, we care about each other. Um, and that's something that I think if we bring it together and if we talk to each other more and if we expose this problem more, we can absolutely solve it because we care. But we need support from people with money. And that's kind of the big thing. We need dollars <laughs> to solve the problem. And we need to find somebody willing to give one thing up to help solve this problem. Yeah. Is there anywhere on campus that you think could use a satellite more than where I have them now? That's a big thing I've been working on recently. You have them in the dormitories? No. I can't get access to the dorms, so you need a key card, but that's something I'd love to work with housing on. Um, yeah, and I've, all, I've also been putting a lot of thought into who are students going to first when they ask for help, when we're talking about emergency grants and who should know about them. I think they should be widely advertised to everybody on and off campus. Um, but if we can't do it that way, who needs to know? Is it advisors? Is it faculty? Um, if you were a student, who do you go to first when you're struggling? That's kind of the thing, too. Do you need donations of like freezers or fridges? <laughs> yes, we need a chest freezer. We need a chest freezer like yesterday. <laughs> um, sorry, that's a grant we've been working on. Um, yes, we're getting like four, four to 500 pounds of ground beef donated at the end of the month. And right now I've worked out a deal with dining to hold on to some of it and we'll come get some at a time. So we just have like a residential style fridge freezer combo. But yeah, chest freezer is a big thing that we've been trying to get donated. Yes, Michael. What do you think bring people out of the shadows yeah, how do you get people to show up and ask for help? Yeah, um, that one's tough. I have this really funky mix of people who are like, hell yeah, I use the food pantry, this is awesome. I need food, you have food, sick. And then I have a lot of other people who are 
red in the face, embarrassed the entire time they're shopping, um, and will constantly ask us, is this too much food? Is this okay? And our answer is always, we will get more food. We will get more food. Worry about yourself first. Like, you take what you need. Um, so I think it's confronting that bootstrap myth that you have to do everything on your own, that you have to yank yourself up by your bootstraps, um, which is not something that many people can do, whether it's because of a societal disadvantage or they broke their leg or their car broke down. They just don't have the money, because the boots are money, uh, to yank themselves up and move forward. So I think it's a lot of like, hey, I've been there too, or hey, I heard about this cool thing. This cool person, Cat, works there. Let's go see what Cat's up to and maybe grab some like potatoes on the way. I'm not kidding about the potatoes. We have a lot of them. Um, it's like 95 pounds. Um, so I think it's a lot of being willing to talk to your friends honestly and saying like, hey, I've noticed you're going through something or hey, I've been going through something. Will you come with me to check this out? Um, kind of like the I'll walk you there approach. And again, I'm very honest when students when students come in our doors, I tell them, like, I've been there too, I get it, I always have chocolate, I crack jokes, I try to make it a really welcoming environment, but that only goes so far when they're facing, like, a big societal, societal stigma as well. Yeah. Faculty Senate question. Um, does Faculty Senate have any influence um, to, to ask the UM Foundation from the faculty perspective to invest in this? Normally, no, but we did induce the president over the summer. I don't know if you know the foundation website. It, it used to be that there were only links to donate to each college. Each dean got that money. There's a new link at the very top. It's called Student Services. That's where the money comes from. We pushed for that. We got it. The foundation did prioritize student services, student experience. Um, it was part of our influence. It was a good idea just in general. No, no, we do have some influence, but um, I mean, Cindy, regularly, Cindy Williams. And they're on the cabinet as well, right? Yeah, and Cindy and I are on a committee called Priority for Action 5, which is Tell Our Story, um, in terms of outreach. And so, yeah, I can, uh, when we started addressing in the summer, because not many of us are here as faculty, uh, we have the opportunity to come to cabinet even all summer, so it's just me and the president a lot of times, and a few cabinet members, and I said, we need help with staff. That was my first priority for me. I know students need help too, but um, if, the, if the staff aren't happy, the student experience goes down. And so I'm hitting it a different way than you guys are, but I said I'll donate 5% of my salary, hoping he would respond the same way. Um, I suggested that we need better ladders for our staff that can be promoted, that when they get reviewed each year, that there's a carrot for that, that there's some money if they do well, there isn't now. Um, I privately, not to the president, but to his uh, chief of staff, I suggested a $16 an hour minimum for our staff, which is, would be revolutionary and across the nation it's really, would be powerful, I think, to draw people in. Because we lose staff all, all the time to Taco Bell or ATG or other businesses in town that pay more than $9 an hour. Um, we've been pushing at all levels. Seth kind of controls the focus of the foundation. But yeah, there's a lot of money coming there. In fact, they're doing a big ask for student services of one of our major donors. A lot of buildings on campus are named for this person. I won't go there, but um, just for student services. So not just the foundation, but private ask by the president. So we're trying our best. And we, we work with the foundation too. They've been awesome in helping us apply for grants. Um, and ASUM as well kind of has that, um, not a ton of influence, but they're able to say on behalf of all students, we think the foundation needs to prioritize the food pantry and that's how they got the um, emergency grants conversation started. And that's why that there are like specific donors um, at the foundation who really want to invest in emergency grants. So it's happening, it's happening really slowly. So what we're looking at now is how do we speed up this process? How do we get people the help they need now? 